A very good morning to you and welcome. This is a wonderful occasion, isn't it? We are here today together to worship, to study. And I trust that uh, what we do, what I say for this little bit, will be uh, helpful to you and above all pleasing to God. I've titled the lesson today, When It's Just Too Much. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said, it's just too much? And what you're referring to can be a number of things. I searched through some pictures and found the picture of this fella with his head down and his hair all messed up and his fingers there as if he's saying, it's just too much. And so I ask, have you ever felt like that guy? Yeah, me too. Back in the 70s, a term was coined, uh, burnout. People talked about others who were burned out. It meant primarily that working people just didn't have the emotional energy, let alone the physical energy anymore. They just didn't want to go. Just didn't want to do. And this was especially true of people who were in the helping professions. And I think it's still true of those who are in the helping positions. I'm thinking about people like nurses. And hospitals are having a shortage of nurses, trying to hire nurses. And I think nurses, after a while, have a tendency just to get burned out. They give and give and give and do and do and do and work and work and work. And finally, it's just like, it's just too much. I'm thinking about mental health counselors, people who listen day in and day out to others who have issues. And I will tell you that there's nothing more frustrating or more tiring than doing that day after day after day. What about teachers? We have members of this congregation who are school teachers. And from talking to them, I know sometimes it's like, uh, I just can't do this any longer. I am so tired. I look forward to retirement. Right, Miss Kim? Ministers, do you realize that the burnout rate for ministers is extremely, extremely high? We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. And even church leaders, even elders, who work their jobs and then deal with all of the issues of the congregation, deal with people who aren't happy with the last decision they made, deal with the uh, what we do and where we go from here. And after a while, it's just like it's just too much. Have you ever felt like your flame is gone from your life? You're just burned out. I want to tell you something that you don't know. I want to tell you that our elders are very concerned about this issue. In a recent elders and deacons meeting, we talked about this very thing. John and Melissa are gone on a little bit of vacation today. But John was the one who said, it just seems like we go, go, do, 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 meet, 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 meet. And I wonder if our people are just not tired. If they're not saying it's just too much. I couldn't resist putting this picture in. 
Who said ministry was stressful? I'm 35 and I feel great. I'm sympathetic to that fellow. I'll tell you. Would you like some scriptural examples of this? Well, if you paid attention to the reading, and thanks to the two fellows who did the reading of those longer passages, then you met a couple of guys who reached the point of burnout. The first one was Moses. He was troubled by the weight of the job of leading the people of Israel. There may have been as many as two million people there. There are lots of estimates. They're all over the map. But Exodus 12, 37 and 38 says they had 6,000 men who left Egypt on foot. And many commentators think that refers to the men who were able to walk the trip. There would have been boys, there would have been old men, there would have been women. And so there may have been as many as two million people. How would you like to be the leader of that bunch, especially in view of the fact that about all they did was whine about everything? I don't know why we left Egypt. At least we had onions and leeks back there. That's a good diet for you, isn't it? And so God gave them manna, but that wasn't good enough. They wanted meat, and He gave them quail, and that wasn't good enough. It was whine, whine, complain, complain. And Moses reached the point where he said, God, just kill me. I'm over it. Uh, that's burnout, wouldn't you think? And then we had that story of Elijah, the prophet of God in 1 Kings 19. A wonderful, wonderful story. He's physically and mentally exhausted. He had had a great battle on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. Baal was an idol god, a Philistine god. And um, he said, if God, Baal's God okay, and if God's God okay, it will put it to the test. You take a, your prophets and you build an altar. And you put a sacrifice on it and then you pray over it and have your God send down fire. And so they did. But their God didn't. And Elijah had a field day. He said, well, maybe he's gone on a little trip. Yell a little louder. So they cut themselves and cried all day long, please, and not a flicker. Elijah builds an altar puts the sacrifice on it, puts the wood under it, and starts dousing it with water. Now, Boy Scouts know that's not a good way to start a fire. And then he called down fire from heaven. And boy, did it come down and lapped up the water, burned up the sacrifice. And he killed the 450 prophets of Baal. Now, you would think that Elijah is walking on air about that time. I can see him going, yes, we showed him, didn't we, God? But there's a woman. Her name is Jezebel. She's not a nice lady. She's the queen. And when she finds out what happened, she sends word to Elijah, you're going to be dead by this time tomorrow. And isn't it interesting that one woman put more fear in Elijah than 450 prophets of Baal did? Now there's a lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> but not this morning. And so he ran. And he sat down under a broom tree. And he had a pity party. He said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life. For I'm no better than my fathers. He said, I'm the only one left. God said, don't flatter yourself. I've got 7,000 more like you. You just don't know about them. So Moses and Elijah. But Mark 6. We didn't read this one. I want to read it with you. 
verses 31 and 32. I picked the short one for me. Signed the long reading to other people. Then he said to them, that's Jesus speaking to the apostles, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Physically and mentally, they were exhausted. People, people, people. Can you imagine how many people were wanting to see Jesus? It might have been a healing. It might have been a free meal. And some really wanted a teaching. It might have been a teaching. But the apostles were forever with Jesus, surrounded by people. And they were physically and mentally exhausted. And Jesus said, Come on. Let's go have a little respite. Let's go into the wilderness, just us. And let's rest a while. Didn't last long. But even the Lord knew that you could get burned out. And it can happen very quickly. What do you think the contributing factors are? If you're like that fellow with his hands and his hair and his head bowed and when I said, did you ever feel burned out? There were people going, yeah, you know what that's like. What were the contributing factors? Uh, tiredness. I'm just so tired. And the tiredness can be physical. But it can also be mental. It can be psychological. It could be my brain is fried. I reach that point sometimes. I come to the office and I sit down and I start doing all of the things that I need to do for the week. And after a few hours of that, it's like I can't even think. Is that in the Old Testament or New Testament? What's that? Ver how many? I, it's time to go home. Get my Diet Coke or my Coke Zero and my recliner and about the time I hit it, the puppy hits me. And I go, <sighs> it can be just tiredness. It can be criticism. You know, no matter what you do, no matter how well-intentioned it is, somebody's going to find fault with it. You know that, don't you? One preacher said he felt like he was nibbled to death by guppies. That'd be a hard way to go, wouldn't it? But sometimes it's a pick, 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 pick. That's the way we feel. Preachers, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, song leaders, people who run the slides, whatever. Sometimes it's at home. Sometimes it's on the job where you work. Constant criticism. What about the constant demand for time, money, and talents? Give me, give me, give me, give me. And this is what our elders were concerned about, folks. I want to tell you that. There was a week when we asked you to give to our lift program. We asked you to give to Hands and Feet at South Knoxville. And we ask you to give to Tennessee Children's Home. The same week. We ask you to come to all the services. We ask you to come to the meeting that we have for the grief group. For the elders and deacons meeting. For the teachers meeting. For the ladies meeting. And after a while it's like. I can only give so much. I can only do so much. I can only so, go so many places. And sometimes it's that feeling of loneliness. Did you get what Elijah said? I alone am left. Sitting under the broom tree. I'm the only one. <sighs> Nobody cares but me, Lord. Nobody else cares at all but me. Can you hear it? 
Have you said it? Sometimes we're overwhelmed with a job. It's just bigger than we are. I, the biggest congregation I've ever worked with was 700 people. I can't imagine 2 million. Tom, we want you to come and preach for us. We've got 2 million people. How many preachers do you have? Well, just one, you. I think I'd say, Lord, uh, you got the wrong guy. That job's bigger than I am. The job was bigger than Moses was, and Moses was a great man. And sometimes it's being idealistic. We're not very realistic. We want things to happen like we think they ought to happen. I see people going, yeah, we do, don't we? We have this ideal view of church. We have this ideal view of family. We have this ideal view of society. And then we wake up. And it's real. And it's not exactly like we thought it was. So what's, what's the reaction to all of this? What do we do? I know, quit. I'm done. Moses wanted to quit. Elijah wanted to quit. Do you know that 40% of full-time ministers as of April 20th or April 2023, that's this year, that's not an old statistic, 40% said they were burned out and wanted to quit. 69%, by the way, said they felt like they should. <laughs> That's up from 11% of 2015. Up 400%. What is there? Well, we went through the pandemic and all of that mess. And all of the yeses and nos and do's and don'ts. And I'm against this and I'm for this. And it wore a bunch of us out. That's a sad statistic, don't you think? that church leaders get discouraged, but so do church members. I can never measure up. I can never do all they want me to do. I can never be all they want me to be. Now they put an article in the bulletin they want me to teach, to volunteer to teach or help in a classroom. What's up with that? Am I not doing enough? And sometimes we just grow bitter. And you can tell when that happens. Good morning. Okay. How are you? Yeah, okay, I'm here. Well, good for you. I see you are in your happy place this morning. What happened to you? Well, if you knew, you wouldn't ask. And I'm so stupid, I ask. And they tell me. And I think, oh no. Overworked people often lash out. People under stress often lash out. And I think it makes us vulnerable. When we feel that way, it's like I have no inner strength, I have no reserve, I have no will to fight. I'm subject to be irrational. I'll say what pops into my head, no matter what it is. I'll despair. I'll think nobody cares but me. I'm alone. And I might even drift into sin. Well, I'd hate to stop right here. If I stop right here, we just might as well all quit and go home. I've got a solution for you. Rest and refresh. You know what Elijah did? He slept. Well, I'm going two hours a night. Yeah, really? How long is that going to take to catch up with you? Rest. Refresh yourself. Jesus asked his disciples to come apart and rest with me for a while. 
And I heard somebody say, if we don't go apart, we'll come apart. And I think there's wisdom in that. This is why we try to give our teachers a break every year so they don't have to teach quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. After a while, it gets tiring. But to give our teachers a break, guess what we need? Somebody to teach that class. You know what our teachers do? Say, well, sign me up again. I'll teach it, but boy, I sure do need a break. That's not healthy, folks. Help us with that. Would you please? Secondly, we need to be realistic in our expectation of ourselves and others. Nobody can or should be expected to do everything and go to everything and be a part of everything. It's all right for you to say, I don't want to be involved in that. It's perfectly all right for you to say that. It's wrong for us to expect you to be to everything we have and do everything we have and be involved in everything we have. That's an unrealistic expectation. I like Moses' father, Jethro. I don't think his last name was Bodine, but I'll check into that. Some of you didn't get that, and that's perfectly all right. But Jethro said, Moses, I got a plan. You're working too hard. I want you to put a judge over a thousand, and a judge over a hundred, a judge over fifty, and a judge over ten. And if they can't handle those, then they come to you. Moses was handling all the problems. All of the gripes and complaints. Moses was dealing with that. How do you do that? And he said, you put some leaders in charge of these smaller groups. Let them handle them. And if they can't handle it, you handle it. I think Moses had wish I'd have thought of that. Put that into place and it worked wonderfully well. Deal correctly with detractors. Expect them. If Jesus had detractors, don't you think we probably will? If Jesus couldn't please everybody, do you think we can? If everything that Jesus said just wasn't accepted wildly, do you think it's going to be, is everything I say going to be accepted wildly? Well, of course not. I recognize that. I understand that. I've been doing this too long not to get that. If there's anything to learn from a detractor, learn it. I've had people say to me, Tom, did you ever think about, and I thought about it and I said, I think you're right about that. And people say, I think you're doing this, and I don't know that you ought to, and I think, I think you're right about that. But if there's nothing to learn in it, forget it and go on. Don't let it stop you. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king of Hoshuaris. He goes to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. He didn't know anything about rebuilding the wall except he knew they needed to re be rebuilt and he volunteered. And he had some detractors. There was Sanballat, that's a name. There was Tobiah, and there was Geshem. And they were constantly picking. And finally they came and said to Nehemiah, you come down and let's meet on the plains of Ono. And we'll talk about this. And Nehemiah said, oh no we won't. He said, I'm doing a great work for God and I cannot come down. Man, I appreciate that. And I have said, we're doing a great work for God and Seymour, we don't have time to deal with every detractor and pay attention to every person who wants to nitpick. If there's anything to learn, we learn it. But what we're doing is too important to let that stop us or deter us in any way. Sometimes we just need to prioritize and balance. Boy, that's easy to say and hard to do, don't you think? What's most important? You know, everybody wants a piece of me. 
your job does. If you're working, they want some of you, don't they? And your family, they want some of you, don't they? And your friends and your church. I mean, everybody's wanting something from you. What do you do? What's most important to you? If you've got to cut something, what can you cut? Sadly, sadly, I know families that cut church so they can do everything else. I would think that's the last thing. Matthew 6.33 But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. There are other things to be sought second, third, fourth, and fifth but the Lord and His will should always come first in our lives. And what about if we form relationships that encourage us? Share your journey. Don't try to go it alone. You're not alone. That's one of the things that we said to our group, our grief group. You're not the only one grieving. And they met other people who were grieving. And there's comfort in knowing that you're not alone. You're not alone at all. There are other people who care about you and what's going on. Share your journey. This morning in class, we talked about the relationship of husbands and wives. And the idea of being submissive, the woman to her husband, and what that means. Not what a lot of people think. And how men ought to love the, their wives as Christ loved the church. Boy, that's a tall order. And so I asked our women, I said, how do you know that you're loved? And they said things that I don't think they had said under a lot of other circumstances. Now it was nothing tentilating or juicy, so don't worry about that. But they just shared their life. And I remarked, we don't have an opportunity to do that very often at church. And they had the opportunity in that class this morning. Share your journey. You're not on it alone. Spend time with those who encourage you, not those who tear you down. You know, sometimes the people that we rely on say, I know how you feel, and I did this, and I'll do this, and you say, you don't know how I feel, and you don't know what you'll do until it happens to you, now just be quiet. Don't share your life with people who are going to make it worse, harder. Share your life with people that pick you up. Hebrews 10 24, he said, uh, we ought to encourage one another. We ought to build one another up. And we indeed need to do that. We need to make sure that we care about one another. And we give and receive that kind of comfort. And finally, take it to the Lord. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything, but with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God, unto the Lord. And the God of peace, what will He do? He will give you peace that passes understanding. Talk to Him about it. Spend some time in His Word. Get you a good book and read it. There are wonderful self-help books. There are some terrible self-help books. But there are some good ones that will lift you up and help you and encourage you. Go to a workshop. Pray. Spend some time with the Lord. Well, here's a final word. God needs you. He needs your talents. He needs your ability. Needs the money he's entrusted to you for his work. But he needs you to be healthy. He does. So take care of yourself. Somebody might be thinking, you know, Tom, 
You know, you forgot that passage in 1 Corinthians 10 that says, God will not suffer us to be tempted above what we're able. So God's not going to put too much on us. So let's just do everything. <laughs> uh, the rest of the verse says, but He'll provide a way of escape. And so when it gets too much, there's a way of escape if we have enough sense to take it. If we'll get some rest. If we'll refresh. If we'll reflect. So you stop. You reset. You regroup. But then you rededicate. Because the Lord needs you. And we need you. There's a poem. And I'm not going to read the poem. It's a long one. I looked it up. But it says, rest if you need to. But don't you quit. So rest if you need to. But don't think about quitting. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You that You have given us the abilities that we have, the strength that we have, the talents that we have, the time that we have. May we be sure to use it judiciously. At the top of our list may be You and Your will for the world. Our part in Your great plan to save mankind. But help us to be realistic to take care of ourselves in doing that so that we can be healthy and ready to serve in whatever ways we need to. Bless those who are just tired, who are burned out. Comfort them and strengthen them through Jesus. Amen.